Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing our third year MFM fellow this morning, Erin Bailey. Uh, so Erin, as you guys all know well, so she has been here three years now. She came, we were really fortunate to recruit her from her fellowship at Wash U. Um, she went to her undergrad in Colgate. Erin then worked as a geologist for a couple of years, which is a slightly less known fact about her. Um, so she was a geologist for a few years and had a life crisis at age 24 and decided to um, get her master's of science and then go to med school. Um, so she was a med student here at UW, went to residency at Wash U. Um, I had the pleasure of overlapping with Erin. She was my intern when I was a third year fellow. And then I sucked her back to Madison for her fellowship. So it's been a very quick and awesome almost three years now, and she is going to stay here as faculty, so you guys will not be rid of her. And she's going to talk today about steroids, since a lot has changed over the last few years in that regard. Come on up. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction, Janine. Um, I'll be talking about antineal corticosteroids today. This all came about, there was a, a meta-analysis that I'll actually talk about a little bit later in the talk that came out recently looking at some of the possible risks of antenatal corticosteroids. And as I started digging into that data, I realized how much I didn't know about antenatal corticosteroids, both the history and then also why we do a lot of the things that we do. Um, and so I ended up in this very deep dive of all of the literature surrounding antenatal corticosteroids. Um, and I hope that you guys find it as informative as I did. I have no disclosures. Uh, for our learning objectives, so we will very briefly, and I promise it will be brief, review embryology. I think that this is helpful to kind of set up why we do steroids, but I promise it will just be very short. Um, we'll summarize the history of steroid administration, assess available published literature, and then we'll discuss future recommendations. So why do we care? So this is a direct screenshot from the ACOG practice bulletin on prenatal birth. And they say the most beneficial intervention for improvement of neonatal outcomes among patients who give birth preterm is the administration of antenatal corticosteroids. So this is basically the single most important thing that we can do for preterm birth. So that's why we care. What do they do? They accelerate parenchymal changes in the lungs. So what does that mean? It means that babies who are preterm who get antenatal corticosteroids, if you were to look at their lungs under the microscope, would look like lungs of older babies. So they advance that lung development. They also increase surfactant production in the lung. So that's how they benefit babies from a respiratory perspective. They also um, decrease the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage, which is a significant cause of, of neonatal morbidity and mortality for preterm babies. And they do that by constricting cerebral blood flow, um, which we'll come back to what some of the theoretical risks are surrounding this. All right, embryology, bear with me. Basically, the way that the fetal lungs develop, if you go back to first year of medical school, so they basically develop from the biggest airways down to the smallest. So we see that at 22 days, the lungs have formed. By 34 days, you can see a right and a left sac. The early period, kind of from three to seven days, 37 weeks, excuse me, is when the bronchi form. And then from seven to 17 weeks is when you're seeing the bronchioles and the bronchioli and then the terminal bronchioli form. And then we get into the canalicular phase, which is basically like 17 to 27 weeks. And that's where this really becomes an important part of fetal development from an antenatal corticosteroid perspective. So this is where we see that um, you're getting the respiratory bronchioli, but it's also where the primitive alveoli form. So you can see that these are the little, you know, my little pink arrow pointing to the primitive alveoli. And then from 22 to 24 weeks, the lamellar bodies form, and they're actually what produce surfactant. Um, after that point, we get into the saccular phase, which is when the alveolar ducts are developing and maturing. And then you get into the alveolar phase after that. And so that's sort of from like 36 weeks to term. And then that actually continues for about 18 months after babies are born. So that alveolar development continues to progress. Okay, that's it for embryology. Just keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward. Just a little bit of history about where steroids came from and how this all was developed. So um, this actually started in 1969. A uh, basic science researcher named Dr. Liggins did some research administering dexamethasone to fetal sheep. And he found that the fetal sheep that got dexamethasone 
um, and were born very premature. In fact, early enough that he didn't even expect there to be visible lung tissue, they were able to see lung tissue. So it accelerated the lung growth and that these fetal sheep were able to breathe when he didn't even expect that they would even have lungs. Um, so then he teamed up with another uh, researcher named Dr. Howie in 1972, and they published the first randomized control trial of human women, human patients, who um, got antenatal corticosteroids. And that trial showed decreased respiratory distress syndrome and then decreased rates of intraventricular hemorrhage for patients, babies of patients who got antenatal corticosteroids. So then between 1972 and 1990, this was like slowly adopted. This was not a massive adoption that came across. Um, recommendations and protocols and the way that these were administered really varied across the world and there weren't great kind of standardized protocols for administering these. In 1990, there was a meta-analysis of 12 other randomized control trials that also demonstrated a reduction in the risk of respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and then ultimately also neonatal mortality. And then this led the NIH in 1994 to come up with a consensus statement advocating for the use in, of preterm steroids. So really at that point, the, the use of preterm steroids took off Unfortunately, there still weren't well-established protocols for when to give them, how often to give them, exactly who should get them. And so we entered this phase of sort of um, discrepant policies and standards among different institutions across the U.S. and the world. And in some cases, um, patients receiving scheduled weekly courses of antenatal corticosteroids um, because the thought was that maybe more is better. Um, so then in 2006, there was a really nice Cochrane review. There's been a couple since then, but this was sort of the first really nice Cochrane review that was done of just a single course of antenatal corticosteroids. And it similarly demonstrated a reduced risk of respiratory distress, intraventricular hemorrhage, and mortality. This one also demonstrated benefits if babies delivered less than 24 hours after administration. So even if these kiddos didn't get that full 48 hours, there was still benefit associated with it. And that was that was seen at that time. They also showed a decreased risk of neck and of sepsis. Um, interestingly, this study did actually look at long-term uh, neurologic deficits and didn't see an increased risk at that time. So kind of from that point on, um, the, the protocols changed and we stopped giving weekly steroids. <laughs> um, and we'll get into a little bit of why that is in a minute. Uh, but the next major change came in 2016, which I remember being a third year medical student when the study came out. Um, it was the antenatal late preterm steroid ALPS trial that demonstrated a benefit and a, a decreased risk of respiratory distress syndrome in infants who were receiving the first course of antenatal corticosteroids between 34 to 37 weeks. Um, and kind of since that time, we have, it's, there have been because the number of people who have gotten antenatal corticosteroids has increased so significantly, it's um, kind of led into this new era of researching what are the risks associated with it and kind of reevaluating the risk benefit of steroid administration, which is where we are right now. So why do we give steroids? So PPROM, about 50% of patients who present with PPROM will deliver within the first seven days, but that means that about 50% of people who present with PPROM won't deliver within the first seven days. Until 2020, basically all women who presented with PPROM were recommended to deliver at 34 weeks, so at least we knew that if they had PPROM that they would deliver early. But then in 2020, the Australian trial came out that suggested that we can actually expectantly manage women to 37 weeks. So now we're in a place where just because a patient ruptures early doesn't even necessarily mean that their baby will be born premature. Preterm labor is another really common reason that we give corticosteroids. There was a recent study done of 491 patients who came into triage for preterm labor symptoms. Of those 491 triage visits, only 30% of those patients ended up being admitted for preterm workup. And then of the patients admitted, only 20% of those ultimately delivered within the next 48 hours. I think not surprisingly to any of us, those who were symptomatic and those who had clinical findings were the most likely to deliver early. But when they took, the authors kind of took a step back and looked at a population level, only, so about 50 to 80% of patients who present to triage with preterm labor symptoms will ultimately deliver a term. 
So all of this to say that both PPROM and preterm labor are super common causes, reasons that we give preterm steroids, but we're not actually very good at predicting of those patients who's going to deliver in the next seven days and who's going to deliver preterm. The next few slides are a little bit of a hodgepodge. It's sort of like, why do we do the things that we do for antenatal corticosteroids? Um, the first question that I had is like, where does this weekly, why, like, where should we be giving patients antenatal corticosteroids weekly? What's the evidence behind this? So as I mentioned in the kind of early to mid nineties, this trend of giving steroids every week came out and there were several randomized control trials, all of which were fairly small, but several randomized control trials that came out looking at whether this was beneficial. And the majority of them were actually stopped early, either because of safety concerns or due to an unlikely ability to detect significant difference. The studies that were published and finished did demonstrate an increased risk of small for gestational age infants, as well as small head circumference. Um, there were two studies that had long-term neurologic follow-up, but neither of them was a, a, were large studies. Um, they didn't show any significant differences, but as I mentioned, they were small studies. So that kind of suggested that maybe weekly probably isn't a great thing, right? So then there was a really large multi-centered double blind randomized control trial that was done through the MFMU network, looking at a single repeat course. So all of the patients in the study had gotten the initial course of antenatal corticosteroids, either betamethasone or dexamethasone. And then they were receiving, they were randomized to receive one rescue course or placebo. And they demonstrated a decreased risk of their composite outcome. Interestingly, their composite outcome was respiratory distress syndrome, which they defined as oxygen requirement, clinical diagnosis, and then uh, chest radiograph evidence consistent with this, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomatia, blood culture proven sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, or perinatal death. Um, but to meet this criteria, patients only had to meet one of those. So they only had to have one of those things to be categorized as the composite. And then when the authors actually looked at which of the composites were significantly improved, they found that the only ones that were, were respiratory distress, need for ventilation and need for surfactant, suggesting that the benefit of the single course of repeat steroids is primarily respiratory rather than impacting other organ systems, but did demonstrate a clear respiratory benefit. Um, so then after this trial came out, there was then a Cochrane review that was done that demonstrated similarly a decreased risk of lung disease and overall morbidity. There was no increase in the short-term risk, meaning while the patients were admitted, the, the fetuses were neonates, I guess at that point, were admitted to the hospital. There was a meta-analysis that came out that showed a decreased risk of respiratory support. It did also demonstrate a slightly increased risk of lower birth weight, but that wasn't, um, didn't impact uh, morbidity or mortality as far as they could tell. And then there was a study that was done that actually just surveyed MFMs as to like what their practice patterns were. And the vast majority, um, uh, like up to 96% reported giving a single course uh, of repeat steroids prior to 34 weeks. So it became really common practice after all of this came out. Um, and then both ACOG and SMFM endorse this practice. Okay, so now we established that probably a single course is helpful. When do we give it, right? This is like the question I think that comes up a lot, a lot on antepartum service. So early in vitro data suggested that there was a six day effect from the antenatal corticosteroid. So that's where that repeat course at seven days comes from. But then there have actually been multiple retrospective epidemiologic studies that have looked at this and it none of them have shown a difference when they are looking at eight to 14 versus less than seven days. So because of that, ACOG recommends 14 days for repeat administration, um, but does allow the languages in there, it's somewhat vague and it does allow for repeat courses at seven days. So that's where that recommendation comes from. Um, in general, the studies seem to suggest that probably the first course is what's causing a lot of those basic parenchymal lung changes. So that's what's accelerating that fetal lung maturity. And then the second course that the, the benefits of surfactant, increased surfactant production are what wane. And the repeat course is probably what is increasing the surfactant production, but that that parenchymal lung change that's happening is probably happening more from that first course. So that's why you're seeing the difference in the courses. So who should get these steroids? What gestational age should we give it to? I think this is where it gets it gets more interesting. 
Um, Perry viability. And, you know, I think MFM is often involved in these conversations. And after reviewing all this data, I think that that's a good thing. These are challenging conversations to have with patients during really challenging times. And I think it's always fair to phone a friend because as became clear to me, looking through this, the data is challenging to interpret. Um, so there was also the ACOG, as we'll get into the ACOG recommendations are very confusing. <laughs> Um, so in 2011, there was a really nice prospective cohort study done of all infants born at 22 to 25 weeks, and they all received beta-methasone. What they found, they, so they stratified all of these births by the week in which the neonate was born. So 22 weeks, 23 weeks, 24 weeks, 25 weeks. And what they found was that there was a very significant decreased risk of neck, hospital death, death at 18 to 22 months. So they followed these kiddos for a while neurodevelopment impairment at 18 to 22 months, and then intraventricular hemorrhage. And that was significant for all fetuses born at 23, 24, and 25 weeks. But when they looked at that 22 week cohort, there was no difference. Neck was still decreased, but nothing else was including mortality. Based on this, ACOG and SMFM recommended against methasone administration until 23 and 0. So here you can see, this is from the practice bulletin on periviability, and I've highlighted here that when you look at, they do a really nice job of laying out what to do week by week when patients present. You can see here at 22 and 0 to 22 and 6, for antenatal corticosteroids, they say not recommended at a le evidence level of 1A. And this is what is from the current practice bulletin on periviability. I pulled this up off of the ACOG website earlier this week. The preterm birth practice bulletin also specifically states that steroids should only be given after 23 and 0, and the antenatal corticosteroid committee opinion also states that it should only be given after 23 and 0. And all of those are like the current ones that are listed on the website. So if you Google those, this is what you're going to get. Then in 2021, there was a meta-analysis of, of neonates born at 22 weeks, and it demonstrated that steroids improve survival. They listed a pooled survival of their meta-analysis of 29%, which is pretty high. I think for people in the audience who have taken care of 22-weekers, that's significantly higher than what most of us would quote. Um, I would say national averages are probably closer to 5 to 10% survival. There certainly are institutions that have survival rates at a lot higher than that, but 29% um, is pretty high. And then when they looked at the pooled survival, they found that neonates who got steroids had a 39% survival versus a 19% survival. And this was survival to hospital discharge. Um, but 39% is, is pretty, pretty high. I would say, um, not surprisingly when they actually did a, a trend of time, they found that survival rates increased between 2000 to 2020, which I think should surprise probably no one in the audience, given how extensively neonatal care has improved over the last 20 years for periviability. When you dig into the data a little bit, and I apologize, this is a little bit busy, um, but basically what it shows is along the bottom is the survival rate. And you can see these are all of the studies that are included here. And so you can see down at the bottom, the overall survival rate is just below 0.3. So it's at 0.29. Um, and most of the studies, right, fall less than that, like 30% survival. They're all anywhere from kind of zero in many cases to, you know, 15 to 20%, which seems pretty on par with what I think most people quote nationally. When you actually dig into the data of like, what are these outliers that we're seeing? I don't know if my pointer's working. But you see these outliers that are all the way over at like the 0 0.8, 0 0.9. When you dig into the studies that actually are contributing that, so this top one, this cuts and all from 20, 2009, they demonstrate um, an 80% survival of 22 weekers. But interestingly, the study itself actually had 11 22-week babies that were born, only two of whom actually survived to discharge. But they didn't count eight of them because they didn't receive all of the full interventions. And so they counted only two of the 11. And then the other point is that the one of the two babies had very low intact survival, left with like basically everything. So they're looking at overall survival, not intact survival. So one of these was basically a study of two kids. Um, 
the Watkins 22, 2020 one down at the bottom that also demonstrated a survival of about 65%, interestingly pooled both 22 and 23 weekers, um, which as I think we can all appreciate is a very different survival and kind of um, very different clinical scenario. A 23 week baby is very different from a 22 week baby. Um, and then a lot of these cohorts are, are not from here. So both the Mailer and the Humberg were both cohorts that were out of Germany. So a little bit unclear how much that really applies to like U.S. national standards. So all of this to say that the study, you know, I think was was well done. But when you actually dig into the data, this pooled analysis, I think, is is somewhat misleading a little bit. Um, but because of this. ACOG and SMFM modified their recommendations to state that betamethasone can be admitted, administered at 22 weeks, zero days. And they published a new practice advisory on corticosteroid administration at 22 weeks. And in that practice or in that practice advisory, they have the similar table, but now it says that 22 and 0 to 22 and 6, you can consider antenatal corticosteroids. So all of this to say that I would say the evidence is 2C compared to 1A, right, from before. So very different levels of evidence, but you can certainly consider it. Um, and it's absolutely reasonable. But I think it's really tricky because when you have a patient who's coming in in the middle of the night and you're looking up, well, what does ACOG say? It depends on which ACOG page you land on. Um, but the, this is the newest recommendation and all of those other committee opinions, practice bulletins and practice advisories do have a flag at the top that says, please see the updated practice advisory. It's just small and easy to miss. So I wanted to highlight that because I think that this does come up a lot, that it's easy to miss this updated practice advisory and it is reasonable to give steroids a 22 and 0. Late preterm steroids. I think this is something that um, for the non MFMs in the audience, we give a whole lot more than we do for periviability. So I'm actually going to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about late preterm steroids. Cause I think this has really been the, the controversial aspect of it and, um, where a lot of the evidence and, and data has been recently. So the ALPS trial, it was a really nicely done double blind randomized control trial at 17 centers in the MFMU network. All patients were 34 and 0 to 36 and 5 with no previous steroid administration. They were ineligible if suspected delivery was less than 12 hours from time of administration of the first dose. Multiples, just because they're really challenging to include in any sort of statistical study, so they're almost always excluded. Pregestational diabetes was excluded. Gestational diabetes was not excluded, so that was not an exclusion criteria. And then if the fetus had known anomalies, they were excluded. And what they found was that um, when they looked at need for respiratory support, it was 11 versus 14%. Uh, this was statistically significant and the number needed to treat was 35. And then for severe respiratory morbidity, they looked at, um, it was eight versus 12% with a number needed to treat of only 25. Um, the steroid group did have an increased risk of hypoglycemia, which we'll dig into a little bit um, in just a few minutes. And I, I think one thing that I just want to highlight is that among both of these groups, only 60% of patients actually got both steroid, administ steroid doses administered prior to delivery. So even when the authors were intentionally excluding anyone that they thought was going to deliver within 12 hours, still just over half the patients were able to actually get both of the doses. Um, so, you know, I think when we're thinking about, do we administer, do we not, that 12 hour mark is important, but knowing that this data is based on almost half the patients not getting both of those courses. So where, what has happened since ALPS? I think ALPS is this fascinating phenomenon that happened where it was a single randomized control trial. And as I'll demonstrate, our practice patterns shifted immediately. I mean, really, as soon as this paper was published, we as a, as a field modified our practice. So this is just looking at corticosteroid use. This is just prevalence of patients who got late preterm steroids pre and post ALPS. So this gray area for all of the next slides is the kind of period at which it was published online and then published in person and then, and then presented. So it runs from February, 2016 
Um, and then it was published on April 16th. So that's kind of where that gray area is. And then the <clears throat> after part is afterwards. So you can see that pre-ALPS, only about three to 5% of patients were getting late preterm steroids. And then by October 16th, so less than six months later, we're up to 12%. It's doubled the number of people who are getting antenatal corticosteroids. So this like really changed practice patterns. What happened for the non-study populations? I think this slide is actually like really interesting. So both twins and pregestational diabetics were excluded from this trial, right? Despite that, again, within six months of this trial being published, look at the trend for twins. It went from, again, about 10% of twins getting late preterm steroids to more than 20 and with a, with a steeper upward trajectory. And these are for, for patients that weren't even included in the original trial. Twins, I think, is reasonable, right? They're excluded generally from a statistical perspective. It's usually just to make your trial easier to analyze. I think physiologically, people feel like they're probably not that dissimilar, particularly from a steroid administration perspective. What I think is even more interesting is look at the significant jump up for pregestational diabetes. These were patients that were specifically ex excluded. Uh, because of the risk of moms becoming hyperglycemic with steroid administration. And again, within six months of the trial being published, the number of patients receiving late preterm steroids who had pregestational diabetes almost doubled. Uh, this has led to um, a significant increase in the number of fetuses who are born at term who have been exposed to antenatal corticosteroids. You know, as we've talked about, we're really just not great at figuring out who's going to deliver early. We do our best. We make the decisions that we can, but a lot of this is just really unpredictable. And um, as you can see here, prior to the ALPS trial, um, there were about four per thousand births of term babies that were exposed to antenatal corticosteroids earlier in their pregnancy. And again, within about six months, that doubled to eight with a, with a kind of a steep upward trend. So we're seeing a lot more term babies who have had antenatal corticosteroid exposure now that we're giving late preterm steroids. And this, this change happened almost immediately. Um, I also think that this is interesting there. So this four per a thousand, um, was immediately after the Alps trial, this, uh, 2023 article demonstrated that the almost 40% of fetuses receiving steroids prior to 34 weeks are born at term. So again, just highlights the fact that we're not great at predicting who's going to develop, who's going to actually deliver preterm. Um, and that a lot of these babies end up making it to term after receiving steroids. Uh, so what do patients want to know? What do patients want to hear about antenatal corticosteroid administration in the late preterm period? There's not a lot of qualitative work on this. I found one article and I think <laughs> my takeaway from this is that it's really varied, which isn't surprising. Overall, the themes of, and the conclusions were that patients want to know both about the respiratory and neurologic risks associated with late preterm uh, administration, both of receiving and of not receiving it. Interestingly, the study also interviewed OBGYNs and asked them what they were telling patients. And the vast majority reported counseling on the respiratory risks, but very few discussed the neurologic risks associated with it. Um, but then when you actually dig into the specific patient comments, I think this highlights the fact that every patient is very different and unique and the patient provider relationship really matters. Participant number one says, given that we don't know the long-term risks of antenatal steroids and that this is later on where the benefits aren't as clear, it becomes, I think, more of an individual choice into what's important to you. And so it feels like something that I would be better suited to decide with the doctor's guidance and help. In complete and total contrast to that, participant number 11 says, I would prefer that they, meaning the physicians, make the decision and counsel me through it because I think it's still a lot of information to parse. And I think both of these are really valid and I'm sure that we've all come across patients who have both of these thoughts. It makes it really challenging to counsel, but I think really highlights that need for a good relationship there. Cost effectiveness. Um, so Dr. Gianfi Bannerman, who was the lead author on the ALPS trial, subsequently published a cost effectiveness analysis. This is a very odd graph <laughs> for how they chose to present their data. 
But basically, they looked at mean costs associated with receiving late preterm steroids and then not receiving late preterm steroids. And what they found was that the mean costs were 4,681 for the beta methasone group and 5,379 for the placebo. These are showing the wide variety in the actual um, costs for each uh, group. As you can see, I think that's not totally surprising, right? Some of these kiddos went home with a completely uncomplicated hospital stay, and some of these kiddos ended up in the hospital for months. So there's a widely varied. But when they actually looked at the difference between the two, it was statistically significantly lower for the beta methasone administrative, administered group, suggesting that from a cost effectiveness perspective, this is a good thing to be doing. Um, so what are the risks? So we've kind of highlighted that we have greatly increased the number of patients who are receiving antenatal corticosteroids. And as that's happened, and as more of these fetuses that are exposed to it are born at term, it's raised and highlighted the possible concerns associated with side effects and risks associated with it. Um, you know, clearly there is a very clear benefit for preterm babies who were born prior to 34 weeks. But then the question becomes that the benefit's not quite as good from 34 to 36 and six um, are the risks. What is that risk benefit analysis and how does that all play out? So the first one, and I think we're all pretty familiar with this. I think we all do a really good job of counseling about it. The risk of hypoglycemia. So the ALPS trial did demonstrate a significant risk of hypoglycemia in the beta methasone group. Um, there was a subsequent retrospective cohort study that came out um, in 2020. So it was late preterm births from 2015 to 2018. So this encompassed when ALPS was published. And it showed an increased risk of hypoglycemia in the beta methasone group as well. Uh, Gianfi Bannerman, as I mentioned, the lead author on the ALPS trial, published a secondary analysis of the, ran the randomized control trial. And um, I think this was interesting. So they found that the beta methasone group did have a higher rate of hypoglycemia, but that that hypoglycemia was transient, meaning less than 24 hours, um, and actually resolved significantly faster than hypoglycemia from patients that weren't in the beta methasone group. Um, and when they actually looked at prolonged hypoglycemia, there was no difference between the two groups, meaning hypoglycemia that, that lasted longer than 24 hours. Um, then there was a cohort study that has been published more recently that suggests that there's an increased risk of hypoglycemia, particularly if patients deliver less than two days prior to the beta methasone administration. So patients who aren't completing that first, that full 48 hours of their corticosteroid course are more likely to have um, hypoglycemia, which I think is what we see when we're monitoring mom sugars too, right? Like that's when the hyperglycemia really spikes and then causes the hypoglycemia in the babies. Neurologic outcomes. I think this is something that we don't talk about as much. Um, it's really come to the forefront, particularly in the neonatal liter literature since the late preterm steroid trial was published. Um, there's been, I think in large part because of this known um, constriction in cerebral blood flow, a concern of long-term neurologic outcomes. And a lot of the studies that we have done up until this point didn't have long-term follow-up for these patients. And so it was a little bit unclear what happens two, six, 10 years down the road after we've given antenatal corticosteroids. So there was a really large Finnish population trial study that was a retrospective cohort that was published that, that showed that there was an increased risk of any mental and behavioral disorders in term, but not preterm exposed neonates. So that means that babies that were exposed to antenatal corticosteroids during their pregnancy and then ultimately delivered preterm, there was no difference. If those kiddos ultimately delivered at term, there was a difference. That study used um, their, they were sibling matched pairs though. So what they did is they took babies who were exposed to antenatal corticosteroids and then found their siblings who were born at term or preterm that didn't have exposure to antenatal corticosteroids and compared the two, which I think is a little bit problematic because if the patient is receiving antenatal corticosteroids during that pregnancy, that pregnancy is inherently more complicated than a term pregnancy in which 
they didn't receive antenatal corticosteroids. And controlling for whatever that indication was is really challenging. There was then subsequently in 2021, a meta-analysis that was published that showed an increased risk of neurodevelopmental and or psych disorders, again, in term neonates. In this case, they looked at patients that received an unknown number of courses of steroids. In patients who received just a single course of steroids, there was no difference. And we're gonna dig into that data for just a minute. You can see here, this is from the, um, the finished trial. And you can see here, so this goes out to nine years. So they followed these kiddos for a really long time. Um, and you can see that in term deliveries in the treatment exposed, meaning beta methadone exposed term babies, there was an increased rate, which that rate increased as you go further out in life. So those differences became more notable the older these kiddos were um, for any mental or behavioral health disorder. So this is, and I apologize, this is a little hard to read. So forest plots, just to orient everyone for just a second, the line in the middle is the null. So that basically means there's no difference. In this case, to the left of the line means that it favors the standard course, which is favors beta methadone administration. So things that are to the left favor beta methadone administration, things to the right favor no beta methadone administration. And what these number with this, um, the way that this meta-analysis was set up was that they divided the, the studies into those where there was a known single course of beta methadone administration, so just one, compared to an unknown number of courses. So there were several trials that were published that didn't say how many times babies got steroids. So this is the data for the single course. So babies that got a single course, you can see here that when we look at um, neurodevelopmental impairment in children with preterm birth, and then cerebral palsy in children with preterm birth, and auditory impairment in children with preterm birth, all of those are significantly improved if those kiddos got steroids, a single course. Cool, we basically do that, right? What I think is really interesting about the study is that they specifically say, 20 of the 30 included studies had long-term outcomes for children who were exposed to an unspecified number of courses of antenatal corticosteroids versus those who were exposed. However, most of these studies likely included a single course of antenatal corticosteroids because that was the most common clinical scenario during that study period. But we already know that the vast majority of MFMs report giving a repeat course of steroids, right? We've already established this. And it says that a repeat course of corticosteroids became widespread practice in the early 1990s. And in a 1996 survey of MFMs, 96% reported giving a second course. So it's fairly unclear to me why the authors make the assumption that the studies that had a, an unknown number of courses, these fetuses only received one course. I suspect probably a lot of them received more than that, and we just don't know how many. So here is for the unknown number of courses. This is highlighting the two significant um, findings that they found against betamethasone administration. So the top one is any mental or behavioral disorder in children with preterm or full-term birth. And you can see here that it favors the unexposed group. But when you actually look at it, all three of these studies are a single study. So it's all based on just one study. So yes, this is a meta-analysis, but this piece of it is based on just one study. And that study is that finished trial that I already talked to you about with the sibling matched pairs. So again, this is based on the same the same information with no additional data included. Similarly, they found that any mental or behavioral disorder in children with preterm or full-term birth, again, was statistically significantly worse for kiddos who got beta methasone administration, but again, based on a single study. So yes, this is a meta-analysis, but when you actually break it down and look at it, they're basing this off just one trial for each of these. So recently, <clears throat> ALPS published their follow-up data. So this is a randomized control trial, and they followed these kiddos out for six years. This isn't published yet. This was a late-breaking abstract at SMFM. Um, so I've kind of stolen some of Dr. Gianfi Mannerman's slides. Um, but this was a prospective follow-up. So this was a planned part of the ALPS trial for children who were at least six years old of patients enrolled in ALPS. 
And they did a lot of different cognitive testing. So they did cognitive testing using the DAS-2, which is a differential ability scale two, and this was their primary outcome. They did, they looked at gross motor function classification, social responsiveness, and then child behavior checklist. As I mentioned, their primary outcome was a DAS-2 score of less than 85, which like basically for your purposes just means it's less than one standard devi deviation below the mean. So these kiddos are have to be fairly delayed. They had 949 of the 2300 ALBS participants who ultimately participated. Um, they did make a note that they struggled because of COVID um, in the middle of all of this retaining recruitment. But here's what they showed. There was no difference. So at least looking at um, the DAS-2 scores, there was no statistical difference at six years, at least six years. Some of these kiddos were followed up longer than that at at least six years. They also looked at gross motor function and then social responsiveness scale. And then there were also no differences that were seen within any of the subcomponents of the DAS-2 scale either. So where does this leave us? Like, what do we do with all of this, right? So it is quite clear that a single course of steroids improves outcomes for preterm deliveries between 23 and 34 weeks. I think we all knew that already. This data really highlights that. We're also not very good at predicting who's gonna deliver preterm. We do the best that we can and we give steroids to those who we think need it. And I think that's really reasonable and a super appropriate approach. It's really unclear if it's beneficial prior to 22 weeks. I think our general approach has been to give it to patients who want all interventions. Um, but again, this kind of goes back to that. We're not great at delivering, at predicting who's actually going to deliver preterm. And if we're giving steroids to 22, week, I would say the big risk here is that we're giving steroids to 22 weekers, counting that as that course. And then if it's not beneficial, then that only leaves them with one course later on. Not that we shouldn't do it, but that's sort of like that risk analysis that you have to think of in your head. Probably a single repeat course is good. Certainly it helps from a respiratory perspective. It's really unclear what the long-term outcomes are. I would say the data remains really pretty mixed. I would say late preterm count patients should be counseled both on the respiratory, but then I think it's worth bringing up some of these neurologic concerns and counseling patients on it, particularly given that the benefit is a little bit less clear in that late preterm period. Certainly late preterm increases risk of neonatal hypoglycemia, um, but, there, and lastly, I would say that there's likely no increased risk in the neurologic risk for babies who are actually born preterm. So I think that that, that data is pretty clear, but then what happens to these kiddos who are actually born at term? I think it, it's still a little bit up in the air and unclear. Here are all of my million references. If you have any questions about them, I'm happy to send them because I know no one can see them. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Rhodes and everyone in the MFM division and all of you wonderful residents who make working here just an absolute joy. And then Jackie and Scott, who are the best co-fellows, and Brad, who I miss dearly and texted last night and gave a much more entertaining grand round talk than I. Um, and then these lovely humans who keep me sane, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Erin. That was lovely. Good work. Um, these are the things that get us excited. So I don't know if everyone else feels that way. <laughs> um, but if you do, you should do MFM. Um, I think that, you know, what do you, what is your take home? I think the common question we get are these late preterm patients who come in with the labor and we are watching them on ante because they're two or three centimeters. And what's your personal threshold for late preterm steroids? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, and I think every other MFM in the world would really like to see a stratified analysis of the impacts and benefits by week in the late preterm period from 34 to 36 weeks. Physiologically, it makes a lot more sense to me to give late preterm steroids to a 34 week patient. I think that those neonates are really probably still benefiting from it a lot more than a 36 week patient. So despite the fact that we don't have the epidemiologic data to support that based on the way that we know that steroids work and the physiology, I shy away from giving steroids to 36 week um, patients, but, but I'm more aggressive with 34 weeks. Um, I will give it in twins. Um, I don't give it in pregestational diabetes, patients with pregestational diabetes. I generally don't give it to patients with gestational diabetes particularly if they're on insulin, 
because of that risk of hypoglycemia. I mean, we know that risk is real. Anyone else have a question? Oh. I do from the audience. I'll, I can re I'll repeat Awa's question so that no one has to walk one up there. Um, I'm Good question. So Awa's question is what what does the other, how does the other side of of birth doctors feel? Like what do the pediatricians think about all of this? Um, I think that not being a neonatologist, I don't want to speak for any of them. I think that the neurologic concerns are something, a lot of that kind of research and literature is being driven by the neonatology field. And so I think their fears of the neurologic concerns are, um, are significant. Um, I would say it, my N of two, <laughs> the, um, the thoughts vary by division. Um, the perspectives and thoughts vary, vary by division. Um, you know, clearly for babies born prior to 34 weeks, they want steroids. And then I would say I've definitely heard kind of mixed reviews on how they feel for 34 week to 36 week. Um, neonates again, in general, I would say I've heard a lot of people sort of echo my sentiments that 34 weeks, they're still probably beneficial by 36 weeks, potentially less so. Um, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of variance as well. 22 weeks, I would say the vast majority of centers that are resuscitating 22 week babies recommend steroid administration. Um, just to try to get, you know, any, any possible benefit on board. Was there a question online? I had a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Dr. Gaston. Hey, how you doing? Sorry, I was in sign out and then I just stayed over here at the uh, call room. So that, that this has been a long evolution since I started. Uh, we used to give steroids every week, uh, in the early 90s uh, and when patients were at risk for preterm birth and started backing off when we started noticing smaller head sizes and things like that. Um, and uh, there are a couple of things that have kind of persisted in my mind. Uh, one of them was this issue of the late antenatal corticosteroids because that was the first time. It was a struggle to get people with all the evidence we had before the NIH consensus conference back in the 90s. And so, um, but we changed that based on one, like rapidly based on one study. Um, and the question becomes, is there any intention that we can do during that time period uh, monitoring or controlling those glucoses? Because um, it's probably like an eight to eight to 48 hour period or somewhere in that range that puts those babies at risk. Is there anything that we can intervene with treatment wise, uh, di you know, diagnosing uh, checking the sugars and treatment that would help with neonatal hypoglycemia. And two, if you could comment on 12 versus 24 hour dosing. Um, so the vast majority of the patients in the ALPS trial were admitted with glucose management, like as appropriate during it, similar to how we would do it here. Granted, these were, you know, it was many different centers nationwide. And so their maternal hyperglycemia protocols varied and it was based on whatever that hospital did. But almost all of these patients were admitted during that time with hyperglycemia control. So these increased risks of neonatal hypoglycemia are in the setting of, you know, attempted in hospital hyper maternal hyperglycemia control. So I would say that that piece of it's similar to kind of what we do here, although granted, maybe slightly differing protocols. Um, the 12 versus 24 hour administration. Um, I have not seen compelling data for a 12 hour administration. Okay. Most of the data the, seems to support 24 hours with two, well, depending on whether you give dexamethasone. So dexamethasone is, is six milligrams every 12 hours for four doses, which is just a more burdensome protocol. So most places use 12 milligrams of beta-methasone every 24 hours. There's, I didn't get into this, but there's been studies that have looked at the difference between the two and there's no difference. So they're both equally as effective. It's just one is 
four shots, one is two shots. Um, but I have not, I've not seen any compelling data to suggest that we should be transitioning to 12 hour courses. Okay. Now, when you say diet control of their glucose is what, what, why do we think those babies, I mean, because we, we tend to tend to think that if we have hyperglycemia in labor or prior to, to labor that control in their sugar, um, helps reduce their risk of hyperglycemia. Why don't we think, you know, and I'm, you know, why don't we think that controlling it uh, in that steroid window period of time, that, that doesn't help in terms of the hypoglycemia versus what we do for regular diabetes and pregnancy? Sorry, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So you're asking, why do we see hypoglycemia even when we're controlling blood sugars among patients who receive betamethasone? Yeah, versus like our diabetic patients who were doing that same thing with the goal of trying to prevent neonatal hypo hypoglycemia. Is it something that, else? So all of the evidence that I've seen suggests that this is an in, basically an increase in blood sugar and and uh, increase in, in insulin resistance from the steroids. And, you know, similar to a neonate of a patient with diabetes, that even if we have her have that patient on a, on a drip, on an insulin drip during labor, that neonate remains at elevated risk for hypoglycemia postpartum, um, or after delivery. I think of it sort of the same way for the antenatal corticosteroids that you're sort of okay. inducing this hyperglycemic state. And even if you're controlling the sugars, there's the physiology has been at least temporarily altered. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And and, 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 and in line with that is, uh, what do you think in terms of that impact? Yes, because there is that ha impact in that baby's neural um, neurologic state in terms of, although you, the, what you showed that there was not any significant difference at six years, but is that then affecting brain development or brain growth or anything that, uh, would have an adverse effect on the baby in terms of neurocognitively? You know, I would say my personal opinion, and I don't, I don't want to be dismissive of the neurologic data because I think that it does concern neonatologists and pediatricians, but I would say my, my review of this data is that particularly with this ALPS trial follow-up, and I have to say, I'm, I'm excited to see the paper because I think that that will provide more information and more, more, um, substance. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not convinced by the increased neurologic risks. Okay. I think it's theoretical, but I would say very much not proven at this point. Thank you for answering my questions. Oh, yeah. Let me look at the chat. Dr. Hanks, when debating beta, uh, when debating beta methasone for preterm babies, I've been told by pediatricians that I can fix hypoglycemia, but I can't fix immature lungs. So what would your response to that be? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I yeah I agree thanks I just I I struggle with that one too so um yeah because I it just you were kind of talking a lot about the hypoglycemia and I didn't know if that if there was something else should, we should be saying to that but no I think it's worth I bring it up because it, it isn't it it increases the risk for these kiddos to need to go to the NICU. And I think that's, Im that's important for, for patients to understand prior to delivery. And I think setting those expectations early is important. Um, but I, what I find even more reassuring is the data from the subsequent trial that was published or the subsequent secondary analysis that was published that demonstrated <laughs> that transient hypoglycemia was increased but prolonged hypoglycemia was not. Um, and so I think, you know, that really, that really reinforces your comment, right? That like that this transient hypoglycemia is fixable. It's not permanent. Um, but I do think that counseling patients on that increased risk of this neonate needing to go to the NICU and to be monitored um, antenatally is really important and will help reduce, you know, anxiety and stress for families postpartum. For sure. 
Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We are over time. Great work, Erin. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening.